Successful companies don't invest in talent so the competition can hire them away. They keep their people motivated to grow with the company and inspire those around them to lean in with them. I believe that talent retention, the same tool used to grow successful companies, can also be used to build great neighborhoods for the people that are born and raised in them. My hometown is the South Bronx in New York City, and it's the kind of neighborhood that one might say resembles a talent repulsion strategy. Back in the 1980s, I walked by this crack house on the way to the subway that would take me to my high school, the Bronx High School of Science, which is one of the best high schools in the country, by the way. Um, anybody from Bronx Science here? Okay, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> it always happens. Anyway, neighborhoods like mine are places where inequality is assumed by those who live there and by those on the outside looking in. These are the places where the schools, public health, air and water quality, parks and trees, food options, and career opportunities are worse than in other parts of the same town. Government subsidized rental housing and health clinics, homeless shelters, liquor stores, dollar stores predominate. Few banks, but plenty of check cash in stores and pawn shops that charge you to use the money that you may have. I refer to these communities as low status. I don't call them poor or low income or underprivileged because status, that word implies something larger at work. That inequality is a well-established fact. Think of the communities like that near you. You know, here it would be East of Troost. They're everywhere. They're inner cities, reservations, white Rust Belt towns, and they're all over the world. And the bright kids who grow up in them are expected to measure success by how far they get away from their hometowns. I was one of those kids. Now I'm a real estate developer and strategy consultant. And I work nationally, but my hometown, my home, the South Bronx, is my research and development lab for restorative community development. That same place that was once a crack house is now my award-winning hip-hop-themed cafe called the Boogie Down Grind. It's two blocks, thank you. Um, <laughs> it is two blocks away from the house I grew up in and around the corner from the place I live right now. And, um, you know, I have to tell you, I've embraced my inner capitalist, and by the way, my, also my inner socialist and my libertarian, depends on the day. <laughs> But what I'd like to talk to you about now is about how capitalism and the spirit behind it, its application, determines how many, its many important outcomes. See, because U.S. capitalism supported slavery and black Wall Streets. Those communities of black folks formerly enslaved are simply one generation out of it, where they built thriving businesses and wealth the most famous being the town of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Black Wall Streets were burned down and the black people in them murdered by white mobs, savagely and without consequence. Now, was that capitalism's fault or some kind of white cultural distinction that remains unaddressed? I know some people don't like hearing about it, but imagine what it felt like, or what it feels like, to experience it. Now, truth is, America has had a talent retention strategy and many talent retention strategies in place since 1619. Slavery provided white Americans all the benefits of its barbaric and predatory industry, while black Wall Streets, although built on the sustainable ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and property, ownership as well, suffered consequences that we experience to this day because we weren't born white. Same system, very different outcomes. Citigroup estimates that the racial wealth gap in the U.S. has cost it 16 trillion, trillion with a T, in just the last 20 years ago. Now let's just think for one moment about the money that could have made it into this economy, but didn't because of systemic racism that defined who benefited from Americans' growth. There's no need to reinvent the wheel here. 
If we want to make America as good as its promise, then we should apply the same tools of capitalism that created white wealth in America in low-status communities, especially in terms of property ownership and real estate development, because real estate development in low-status communities in the U.S. right now currently takes one of two paths. One is poverty level maintenance, wherein you'll see um, the kind of consecration of things like government subsidized housing, affordable rental housing, health clinics, um, and pharmacies, philanthropic dollars, and you know, pour into these communities. And the nonprofit industrial complex views poverty as the authentic cultural attribute of the area. And thus, you'll see all sorts of programs that are designed to manage that poverty, but the communities don't improve. Money is being made from all this, but it's not for the local people and certainly not to their benefit. In fact, one could view many well-intentioned programs you know, in, as a talent extraction process where the most promising talent is encouraged to grow up and be somebody, but far away from their own hoods. The other type of development is gentrification displacement. You know, that's when urban populations grow, some politicians and activists resist greater density, so you have rising demand and limited supply and prices go up. Gentrification means outsiders coming in to change the community so it benefits their needs and desires, not those of the ones that are already there. Not that they're always mutually exclusive, because people in low-status communities, we like nice things too. That's why many of them leave when they can to experience them. So capitalism can fuel gentrification and displacement or poverty maintenance, but neither of those strategies help the people already there to live in the kind of neighborhoods that we all deserve. What if we looked at low-status communities as though they were struggling companies? How could we turn them around? How could we apply a talent retention strategies to neighborhoods? Municipalities, for example, hand out corporate retention packages because they believe that the benefit of having economic activity is worth the price of that subsidy. We'll need to do that with the people in low-status communities who believe that they should measure success by how far they get away from them. We can't force them to stay, but we can nudge them with lifestyle infrastructure, the type of places that our survey data told us they were seeking. Places like cafes and bars and restaurants, farmers markets and bookstores, they build positive community interactions and honestly they make people feel cool, like, like they want to be seen in places like that. You know, another nudge would be real access to property ownership and business ownership that keeps people vested in their neighborhoods. These are, these are like benefits and stock options. When the community does well, so do the residents. It's kind of like um, uh, the employees of a hot startup. So how do we make sure that these benefits and stock options get in the right hands and appreciate in value for them? So in the US, if you're accused of a crime and can't afford legal counsel, one, a public defender will be assigned to you. The same can be done for local property owners in low status communities. Before a real estate transaction goes forward within a low status community, the seller should receive quality, legal and financial counsel, so they're fully aware of the value of their property and also learn how to maximize it through sensible refinancing to do things like building rentable vertical additions and accessory dwelling units or using the value to put their kids through school you know, or start a business. And maybe these property owners could be classified by the Security and Exchange Commission as a protected class to protect black wealth, in particular, and other low-status community wealth from continuing liquidation. Because it is common for people who own property in low-status communities to be approached with fast cash offers by predatory speculators. This can be a very enticing, um, you know, for a person you know, whose most of their life has been told that there's no real value in their communities. That is a fact that real estate and private equity firms use to their advantage. And they've done a very effective job of separating, and of actually of increasing wealth inequality as they separate financially unsavvy people from any future potential generational wealth equality. 
The SEC recently proposed new rules requiring businesses to report their greenhouse gas emissions in, in an effort to increase transparency risk for their investors. It sounds, that's a great idea. Maybe they should do the same thing for taxpayers, because we know that real estate and private equity firms can engage in predatory practices at the expense of taxpayers by privatizing the profits that they get and socializing the costs to taxpayers. And this is because a business model that reduces opportunities for homeowners also creates more landless renters, exacerbates the concentration of poverty, and statistically increases poverty's ill effects, including higher rates of bad policing and incarceration and lower health and educational outcomes. Their methods shut aspiring homeowners completely out of their American dream. It comes at a cost to all of us some more than others. So it should come at a far greater cost to those who do business like that. Another issue is that some renters pay more in rent than they would on a mortgage. But most of us who need mortgages cannot compete at the speed at which predatory buyers show up with all cash deals. A possible solution is for philanthropic organizations to buy properties at market value from those who choose to sell after they know the, the, how, what that actually means, and hold them so that other folks within those communities can have the time to get the financing and buy them. That is a valuable cushion of time. It gives people a chance, and, a very, and it's a very, very low risk you know, to park capital. These are just some examples of how we can use, um, how we can use a restorative economics approach to capitalism. It's still capitalism but with rules and practices that favor the outcomes we need as a nation. But there are folks on the ground that are already moving. In West Oakland, California, third generation West Oaklander Noni Session leads the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. They've recently acquired property collectively to build permanent, affordable, mixed-use developments that benefit resident owners. The cooperative offers lunchtime learning sessions to help folks understand how to leverage real estate investment and development. And their current membership includes more than 500 you know, local um, community members, um, investors, residents, and staff owners. And they have, to date, raised nearly $5 million for their community land and housing fund. I know. In Philly, or in Philadelphia, um, a community development uh, program called Jumpstart, which was started by Ken Weinstein. He's a commercial real estate developer, um, and, that, and Jumpstart provides uh, training and loans to aspiring local developers, um, mostly women and people of color. Um, and since 2015, more than 1,000 people have gone through the program. There's been more than 200 loans, totaling more than $22 million, and the rehabilitation of 300 units. Um, their respective activities improve the value of each other's projects, and these folks are reduced blight as they build wealth from the inside out, making a difference in 13 uh, communities around the country to date. Dune Lankard of the EAC tribe is securing livelihoods for native youth and women uh, through kelp farming on ancestral native lands. Kelp is this traditional food source that has important commercial applications as well in, in bioplastics and pharmaceuticals, um, cosmetics, and of course food, but it also can be used as an additive in cow food, cow feed to, like, um, to, to reduce methane, which I think is incredible. Um, he's competing now against multinational companies who want to own this emerging industry, but I know they're going to be successful. Um, and in the South Bronx, there's a historic rail station that brought my daddy, who was a Pullman porter, um, into the neighborhood where I was born and raised. Because back in the 1940s, it was even harder than it is now to get a mortgage while black. And he won $15,000 in a horse race in LA, carried it across the country, and purchased a home for his family near that, that station. Um, and now, and it, that station was acquired by his baby daughter, who is transforming it into a talent-retaining, multi-use performance venue and event hall. I know, right? It is that cool. Um, for music, weddings, quinceaneras, I mean, you name it. Because I know my mommy and daddy are so, so proud of me right now. And I just, it just makes me all a Twitter. Um, so, but I'm not saying that, um, talent retention is going to solve 
all the problems associated with poverty maintenance or displacement gentrification or right all the wrongs of, um, of capitalism. But we're not going to solve any of those challenges without talent retention. We don't have to keep building monuments that honor the shameful practices that created the inequality that low status communities face. If we use the tools of capitalism that we have in a restorative way, people in low status communities won't have to move out of their neighborhoods to live in a better one. Thank you. <laughs>